structuralism is a movement in the humanities that emphasizes the search for, well, structure. But what does that mean? What is structure? Let's take a look at two simple examples. First, we take a sentence, say, the man loves the goat. One thing we can do when faced with this sentence is to interpret it, to try and find out what it means. That's what a hermeneuticist might do. But we can also investigate something else, namely its grammatical structure. Then we see that the man loves the goat has the structure subject, verb, object. A structure that it shares with a sentence like the man eats the goat, even though that sentence has a very different meaning. Here is another example. We take a sonnet by Shakespeare. Say the famous Sonnet 18, Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Again, we can analyze the meaning of that sonnet and find out that Shakespeare is telling his friend that he'll make him immortal by writing about him. And we can then connect this interpretation with the earlier sonnets, in which Shakespeare has encouraged his friends to make himself immortal by getting children. But we can also analyze the structure of the poem, to find out that it consists of 14 lines, grouped in certain ways with a certain rhyme scheme. And we can then compare that to the other poems to find out that all of them are structured in the exact same way. What these two examples show us are not a right way and a wrong way of proceeding. They show us two different ways. An approach which is interested in meaning and interpretation that we can call hermeneuticist. And an approach which is interested in different kinds of structure. An approach that we can call structuralist. We looked at hermeneutics in some of the previous lectures and we will look at structuralism in this lecture and the following ones. The man who is often seen as the inventor of structuralism is Ferdinand de Saussure, a linguist. Saussure wanted to explain what linguistics, the study of language, was all about. Now he thought it was not about applying another science, such as history or biology, to language. You can do that of course. You can study the history of language. You can study how talking works in the human body. But that is not really linguistics, according to the Saussure. Linguistics doesn't study the history or the biology of language. It studies the structure of language itself. So, what is the structure of language? I already gave the example of grammatical structure which is certainly one example of the structure of language. But to understand structuralism, it will be more useful to focus on something else, to focus on sound and phonemes. Linguists are, of course, interested in the different sounds produced by speak people speaking different languages or dialects. And one of the things that they want to do is to specify which sounds exist in which language. Now, you might think that this is basically applied physics. You just need to measure the air pressure patterns emerging from people's mouths and then you know what you want to know, right? Well, not according to the Saussure. For he points out that linguists are not interested in sounds in general. They are interested in sounds insofar as they are relevant for language. And that means that they are interested in sounds insofar as they make a difference to meaning. This idea of a unit of sound that makes a difference for meaning is what Saussure calls a phoneme. Take the English words moon and noon. 
they mean something different. The moon is a celestial object, while noon is a time of day. Since these are different words, it follows that the sounds hm and hm belong to different phonemes, different linguistically relevant units of sound. On the other hand, take the English words moon and moon. Even though the sound is quite different, it's the same word. I don't give a different meaning to the word moon just by using a spooky voice. So it follows that oo and oo belong to the same linguistically relevant unit of sound, to the same phoneme. We must notice some important things about phonemes. First, you could never find out about them by doing physics. The pressure patterns of m and n are not more dissimilar than the pressure patterns of u and u. Your measuring instrument can never tell you that the first belong to different phonemes and the second to the same phoneme. The second thing we should notice is that different languages have different phonemes. So for instance, in English, the sounds g and k belong to different phonemes, as we can show with the words god and cod. A god is a deity, a cod is a fish. In Dutch, however, these sounds also both appear, but they belong to the same phoneme. The word boekdrukkunst has a g sound, boekdrukkunst. But we could just as well say the hypercorrect boekdrukkunst. The meaning wouldn't change. And in fact there are no words in Dutch where the difference between g and k makes a difference in meaning. So these two sounds in Dutch belong to the same phoneme. The third and most important thing we should notice about phonemes is that their identity is determined not by some paradigmatic example, but by the entire structure of phonemes that they are part of. Now that's a complicated statement, so let's unpack it. First, the identity of a phoneme cannot be determined by a paradigmatic or core example of that phoneme. We can't say the oo phoneme is the sound oo and everything like it. Because that doesn't tell us that oo is still in the phoneme, but o is not. No, the reason that oo, this loud, long, booming sound, belongs to the same phoneme as oo, is that English doesn't have an other phoneme that is sort of like oo, but characterized by being loud and booming. This means that you can basically be as loud and booming as you like with your oos, you'll never cross over into another phoneme. There's nothing there to cross over into. So we define phonemes not by examples, because that wouldn't work, but by describing the boundaries between the different phonemes of a language. We explain what the u phoneme is by explaining when you cross the boundary from the u of moon into the o of dot phoneme, or the a uh of mug phoneme, or the o of boat phoneme, and even, which is a bit subtle in English, the short u phoneme of book, moon, book. It's good to be aware of even that last difference, because you get a lot less geek credit for Luke, I am your father, than for Luke, I am your father. Anyway, the point is this. In order to explain to you what the u phoneme in English is, I can't just give you some examples of u. I have to tell you about all the other phonemes that surround the u phoneme. And I have to indicate the boundaries between those phonemes and the u phoneme. This means that the English u phoneme is what it is because it is surrounded by these particular other phonemes. 
if it were surrounded by other phonemes, its own boundaries would be different. So a phoneme, so Sur concludes, is what it is because of its place in the whole phonemic structure of the language. If you change that structure by removing or changing one phoneme, many other phonemes will change as well. So, even though someone talking English and someone talking Dutch might both make the same oo sound, it is nevertheless the case that the oo phoneme in English and the oo phoneme in Dutch are different, are necessarily different, because they are part of different structures of phonemes. Unless all of the phonemes of two languages are the same, none of their phonemes will be the same. Now, this is one of the central ideas, maybe the central idea of structuralism. That identity is defined not by intrinsic properties, but by the bigger structure that something is a part of. As we have seen in this lecture, the exact identity of a phoneme is determined by the other phonemes in the language. As you will see in the next lecture, the exact meaning of a word is determined by its relation to other words in the language. And as we will see in the lecture on Vladimir Prop, what makes someone a fairy tale hero is not that they are strong and smart or any other intrinsic property, that is any property that they themselves have by themselves. What makes someone a fairy tale hero is that they stand in certain relations to a villain and to a princess who needs to be rescued. Take away the villain and the princess and the hero disappears as well. So, let's end the lecture by repeating this essential point. According to structuralists, something is what it is because of the structure it is part of. A thing's identity is determined by its place in a greater whole. We'll get to see some of the consequences of that idea very soon.